والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله ان الحمد لله رب العالمين هو الذي جعل المسلمين this is yusuf estes and for the next little bit we're going to be talking on the subject of our new series lifting the fog dealing with the misconceptions misunderstandings and falsehoods attributed to Islam we want to begin by mentioning that the way the muslim should respond to these accusations insinuations is always from the perspective of what the quran and the teachings of muhammad have shown us the methodology or the manhaj of islam dictates for us that we must as muslims always present ourselves and the answers in the best possible light and remove these misconceptions as a matter of fact being a person who came to islam myself i have to understand that there is a mentality out there that people are afraid of what they don't understand after all i've been there myself in fact i remember thinking in the old days before coming to islam oh, what about these people what what are they who are they where are they coming from what's this religion about so when we see these interrogations coming toward us in our auditories that are really harsh that are difficult and insulting it's really important for us to always recall that the prophet peace be upon him experienced this and more much more than this so for us it's not that complicated it's very simple we go back to the way that muhammad peace and blessing be upon him dealt with these same things but for us in the english language we can do it real simple with these simple tactics person comes to you and i'm going to give you an example they say oh are you one of those muslims well we heard you muslims have four wives we want to know how come that a man can have four wives why can't the woman have four husbands well that's a pretty good question and if you think about it how would we answer that if you start to try to explain the quran says this and prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that and this time is different than those times back in those days and here we are in this millennium etc etc you're going to first of all you're going to make a mistake cuz you're not going to give the right answer second of all it doesn't sound like you know what you're talking about you're going to confuse the people and make the situation even worse you'll be frustrated and they'll be confused and that's obviously not what we're after so what do i say how do i handle it regardless of what the question might be our response needs to come the same way every time and be consistent person comes to you in a harsh attacking manner your response should always be thank you for asking me about my religion they're going to go huh <laughs> they're not ready for that <laughs> especially when they came to you with such a harsh statement contained in their question that's why we usually tell them that the best thing for us to do is to begin by remembering that they really don't know and they're confused they've heard people say things so they have the right to know the truth about what is islam and what islam is saying about these particular situations or questions that they're bringing up so we begin by telling them that islam is based on truth we have to tell the truth or we can go to hell so that's very serious for us The second thing is that Islam is having the proof. Everything is documented and preserved and authenticated for over 1400 years. So this is not something that's going to be a difficult problem for us to solve. The third thing I like to tell them is that a lot of times questions are not really questions as much as they are statements. But they have a question mark at the end of it. And sometimes you can't really give a simple answer to a question that has a statement in it. if the statement is incorrect let's give an example of a question that has a statement in it that's incorrect someone comes to you and says can you answer for me a question with a yes or no answer you go okay then they say is your mother out of jail yet what kind of question is this my mother's never been in jail no you said you could answer yes or no we just want yes or no but she's never been I, I, yes or no how can i answer such a question as this because if i say well she's not in jail therefore she's out of jail so i'll say yes she's out then they're going to say what they're going to say oh i'm glad she got out 
but she's never been in jail. And if I say, well, no, meaning that no, she's never been in jail, then where would I be with that? Because the situation now, I'm be saying that, in fact, she's still in jail. And neither one of these are correct answers, but I can't give a correct answer because the question has a statement which is false. And so how can I deal with that? First thing is to take the question and straighten it out and say, do you mean by your question, has my other mother ever been in jail? And the answer, of course, would be no. And that would be the best way to deal with that question. So as we begin to give them the answer to the question by straightening it out, the next thing we want to say to them is, by the way, have you considered that if you hear something in this statement, that when we begin to give you the answers, you hear something you like, and you said, gee, this is nice. This is something I like it for me. And if you heard that in the answer to your question, would you be prepared at that stage to reconsider your life and see what you're doing and then consider worshiping your Lord and your God alone without any partners? Because you see, this is what Islam is really all about. Now, at that stage, they're going to go, what? Because the answer to your question actually shows you why there really is a God. And it shows you why there can only be one God. And it shows you why you have to worship Him without partners. But based on what I just said, would you like to hear the answer? What do you think they're going to say? <laughs> of course, they want to know the answer now. Now we'll come back to that particular question. Why can a man have four wives and a woman cannot have four husbands? Well, first of all, the way they ask the questions, there are different forms of the same question. They say, why does Islam say you have to have four wives? And, of course, on that one, it doesn't say you have to have four wives. And when it comes to the number of wives and the number of husbands, this is something that you have to understand and explain a little bit. So it means you're going to have to have a couple of minutes to sit here and talk about it. First and foremost, though, is to understand that Islam is about what? It's about marriage. Because in marriage, you have a contract. And in a contract, people have rights. So now we get to come to the biggest subject of all. Islam is about rights. About rights. But it has a balance. And the balance is the limits. You have a right. You have a right to have a mate. Someone to be with intimately. Someone to love and care for you. Someone to be compassionate with. And someone to share your life with. That's your right. But there's limits. And this is why Islam is coming from Allah, not from us. It's not a man-made religion. It's not something that I made up or that you can make up or even that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, made up. It is from Allah. Let's understand something. When we begin to talk about the marriage and the idea in Islam of having more than one spouse, that word actually is not polygamy. Polygamy is a word in English which means to have more than one spouse without limit, okay? It can be a number of husbands or wives, okay? The word we're looking for in English is polygyny, which means that a man is able to have more than one spouse, but not the woman. Now, if you said, well, that's, uh, that's limiting, and why is that, and how come it's not fair? Again, I remember to mention to you, remind you, that Islam is talking about what's right and righteous, not about what human beings consider to be fair. And when the verse comes that talks about this subject in the Qur'an, it comes in a very important verse dealing with some other rights, the rights of the yatim or the orphans. This is called Surah An-Nisa, which is the chapter about the women. It begins by telling us not to do something that was the custom of the time, which was to marry little orphan girls in order to inherit their wealth. So that if a child's parents died, some tribal leader could come along and say, well, I'm going to marry this girl. And she's only two years old or four years old. I'm going to marry her. I'm going to take her wealth. And I have the right because they treated women worse than animals. And if they married them, they treated them less than their uh, sheep or goats. So women really didn't have rights back then. So when Islam is coming now, it's saying, first of all, the rights of the orphans the rights of these little children to have their wealth, tells us that we can't take their wealth and mingle it with our own, hoping to increase our own position. So this is something that we begin with, 
mentioning that. And read the verse to him because it does start out by saying, and. And any time a verse starts with the word and, it's only fair that we should look at the verse before it to see what is the continuum of the ayah or the verse. Okay? Because it is dealing with the subject here of how we treat orphans and their wealth. And it's saying for sure that you cannot marry these girls and take their wealth away from them. Rather, you should marry other women of your choice. And then it continues by saying, Ithneen, which is two, Talat, which is three, Arba, which is four. And it says, if you can treat them with equality, otherwise you can marry only one. Well, actually there are limits now which are being set forth in this ayah. The limit, first of all, is that you can only marry two or three or four, provided that you will treat them with equality. Otherwise, you can only marry one. The first limit is the number, because prior to Islam coming, there was no limit whatsoever on how many wives you could have. The men of those days had many wives. Some of them had so many they couldn't count them, maybe more wives than they had sheep or goats. So the first thing that happened for the Muslims was not that they ran out and said, oh, wow, we can get a bunch of wives. It was the opposite. They said, oh, dear, we have to divorce wives that we have. The number must be four or less, and I can only keep wives that I can treat with equality. Of course, this is talking about financial more so than anything else. You have to treat them in such a way that each has the same type of house, clothing, transportation, food, etc. It's not permissible in Islam to favor one over the other in these areas. So obviously, it's going to be very difficult for anybody to have more than one wife. But what is the real limit that we're talking about here? The real limit here is one that's even bigger than that. And when we understand this and present it in the correct way, this then will be what's called the hikmah of Islam, the wisdom in Islam. And it's why so many people, really, when they come to understand the answers to these questions, not only do they comply and say, this is nice, thank you very much, many of them will enter into Islam. And we want to break this down and give you the parts to it so that you can understand it better, so that you can deal with these questions yourself. We'll be back after this, and I want you to think about what we said and see how you would have responded to this same question. Why can a man have four wives and a woman can only have one husband? We'll be back after this, and then we'll discuss it more. Bismillah, we're back. We've been talking on the subject of lifting the fog, dealing with the misconceptions, misunderstandings about what is Islam and who are the Muslims. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes. We've been breaking down one particular subject, and we'd like to treat each one, one by one, through this series. But always we're going to come back with the same initial intent, and that is to present Islam correctly and at the same time encourage the people to understand what is Islam, who is Allah, and what's our responsibility, our purpose in life. The question we were talking about in this case is the one about why can a man have four wives, but a woman can only have one husband? We broke it down in the beginning by saying that the first thing to start with is saying, thank you for asking me about my religion. This does two things. One, it changes the tone of the whole thing from being one of animosity toward one of being a little bit more subtle and a little bit more pleasant. The second thing that it does, it gives us a chance to present it as a real answer to a real question. We begin then by mentioning Islam as the truth, and we must say the truth or else we'll be held accountable on the day of judgment for it. So we're not going to lie. The other thing is that we have the authentic, preserved, 
answers to all of these questions in the Quran and in the teachings of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. So it's already there. When we come to the question then, we make sure that we straighten the question out and remove the obstacles within the question itself because many times people say something in the question that's not correct. So before we begin to answer a question, we analyze the question and remove the things which are not true or influence the statement in such a way that there's no way you can really answer it from the standpoint of Islam. The next thing we do is explain to them that the answers to questions in Islam provide more than just a little bit of understanding. They give us direction and understanding of who is our creator and what our purpose of life is. So that when they're at the end of the answer to the question, it should be that they realize that this, the impact of this answer on them should have a profound effect. And we should ask them, are you going to be prepared at the end of the answer to this question? If you hear things that you like, if you see things here that are things that you say, well, this is something good for me. I'd like that to be a part of my life. Then are you going to be prepared to consider worshiping your Lord alone without any partners? Because, you see, that's what Islam is really all about. Now we'll come back to this question that we've been talking about. Why can a man have four wives and a woman can only have one husband? I want to give you a little something that happened to me one time. At a university, a woman stood up, an elderly woman, rather large uh, woman. She said, uh, I want to know something. How come you Muslim men can have four wives and a woman can only have one husband? I said, excuse me, ma'am, are you married? She said, yeah. I said, okay, why don't you do this? Right now, I want you to imagine your husband. She said, why? I said, no, just, just for a minute. Imagine your husband. He's coming home from work, right? He comes to his favorite chair, sit down, relax. You have to serve him, take care of him, all so on. So you just get this guy in your mind, okay? Just imagine him. She said, and? I said, you got him in your mind? She said, yeah. I said, okay, how would you like to have another one just like him? She said, no way. I said, well, then why do you want four? <laughs> But this really is not the best answer for them. I'll tell you why. Because this isn't the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu would have answered the question. It's a very direct question. It needs a direct answer. The reason in Islam for the four wives is not for the man as much as it is for the woman. And you have to understand that Islam is not just about what I want, but it's also about what you want. So there are rights and there are limits. Everybody has their rights, but there are limits. Let me explain. Islam forbids a man to marry a woman who's already married. You must choose women who are not married. And you must choose from women who are old enough to make the decision. It isn't permissible to marry a girl without her consent. And she can't give it if she's not old enough. So this is part of the verse when saying not to marry these little girls, these little orphan girls. But rather marry who? Women of your choice who are able to decide for themselves that they'd like to get married. But look at the decision they get to make. Because we're going to turn it upside down and we're going to analyze this for a minute. A man is not allowed to marry women who are already married. He's also not allowed to marry more than four. The companions of Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were not enthused about this verse coming in the, from the aspect that, oh, wow, you know, I can go out and get a bunch of wives, because they already had that. There was no limit for them. They could do that. In fact, they had to get rid of some of their wives. They had to divorce wives if they had more than four. And they had to divorce even more than that if they couldn't treat them fairly. So if they were not able to provide for them on an equal basis, then they could only marry one. Now, the woman on the other hand, and by the way, there's always been more women than men. You can go through the annals of history, and you'll notice that there's always more women on earth than there are men at any given point in time, especially these days. A woman has the right to choose any man she would like unless he already has four wives. So this opens up a very big selection for her. She can observe how he treats his other wives. And if he's a good, kind, generous and religious man, and she said, well, I like this guy. Look how he's treating this sister over here. I think that this is the way I would like to be treated. So you know what? i tell you what. I'm going to choose this guy to be my husband. Now, if you said, well, I don't like that idea. Well, nobody's forcing you. In fact, the man's not forced to have four wives. 
A woman is not forced to be in a situation where there are four wives. For the most part, if we look at the Muslims today, we find that that's not the case anyway. The big thing here isn't about the number of wives. The big thing here is that there is absolutely, emphatically, always the insistence that there be no sex outside of marriage. So the emphasis is on the contract of marriage. A man in the West can have as many girlfriends, mistresses, as he would like. No problem. But yet they'll limit him to only one wife. If he has a child out of wedlock, a lot of these guys escape from that. They don't even take care of the child financially. You have to make man-made laws to take care of the problem that comes out of these men having these extramarital affairs. And there's really nothing to stop him from doing this. There's no real law out there that says a man can't have girlfriends. But there is in Islam. It's very clear. If you would like to have a relationship, and this is encouraged in Islam, it's only with your own wife. And you can only have one unless you can treat them with equal fairness. Then you could have two or three or four, but that's the limit. What that does for the woman. Stop and think about it. Here is a man who can only choose from the unmarried women. If there were only two left in the village, that's the only two he could change. Char that's the only two that he could choose from. But in the case of the woman, even if they were all married, she could still choose from those who don't have four wives. So there is something here of balance, of equal rights and equal opportunity. We don't want to present this as being something where it's just for men or just for women, but it's something that gives a balance, and it's from now until the end of the Day of Judgment. It's always there, and it's not from us. It's not from a man, and it's not from a woman. Who is it from? This is from the Rabbil Alamin, the Lord of the Worlds. And if you understood this, and you realize that, gee, this does sound pretty good, then I want you to consider this. Since the time of Muhammad wasallam, it has been always forbidden that a man have any sex outside of marriage. Whether he's married or unmarried, he can't do this. This has changed the way people live. This has changed society tremendously. Just this one particular thing, saying that there has to be marriage and there must be a contract, there must be responsibility taken in any relationship between a man and a woman. Okay? The next thing that we look at is that in the Islamic countries... Muslim countries, even today, we find that the men and women of Islam are the most monogamous. They have the least number of extramarital affairs, if, it is, if you will. And also they have, for the most part, one wife. And not only that, they marry her and stay married to her until one or the other of them pass away. That's very common in Islam. In the Muslim countries, we find the least divorce rate. We find the least of the unwed mothers and children born without parents, without father and mother being married. What we find in the Islamic countries or Muslim countries is that there is a family, a wholesome family, and what that is about, a man and a woman and their children growing together, staying together, and the purpose to be together is to please their Lord, not just to please themselves. This gives us now the opportunity to talk about the fact that this all came from who? From Allah. And Allah is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. This is something He has said. This is not a man-made law. In fact, Islam is not about man-made laws. It's about God's laws for His creation called the human being. And what He takes on one side, He balances on the other side. And so there is always a balance in Islam, as we've noticed with this particular question here and the answer to it. Once we have understood and presented this the correct way, many times what we're going to find, you'd be amazed, the person's going to say, I didn't know that. Gee, this sounds good. Well, I like that for me. And when they start saying that, this is your opportunity to say what? Remember what we said in the beginning? If you hear something you like and you say, gee, I like this for me, this is something that makes sense. Then are you going to be prepared to consider your life and worshiping your God alone without any partners? Because in fact, that's what Islam is all about. It's about doing what God wants, not what you want. It's not about following your lust and your desires. Islam is about pleasing Allah, doing things according to His will. This sums it up. 
And what this does is two things. First, as we said, it lifts the fog of confusion. It removes doubts, and it gets rid of these misconceptions right away. But then it gives them a chance to reflect and think about, what is my relationship with God? What, what am I doing with my Lord? And when they begin to reflect on that, that's our opportunity to say to them, you know, there really is only one God. One God. And what we want to do with our one God is worship Him on His terms. And that word in Arabic is Islam. So if you want to do what God wants you to do, you want God's will on earth as it is in heaven, essentially what are you saying? You're saying Islam. Aslam. It's the slim. This is what Islam is about. Surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace with the Almighty. And really, that's what Islam is about. So the person now has had a chance, by the answer to the question, to see Islam in a whole different picture. Because you've removed a lot of the confusion, and as we say, lifted the fog. And that's what this series is about. We hope that you'll make dua for us to be able to continue this, and that you'll also participate with us in lifting the fog and the misconceptions about Islam. Until next time, it's Yusuf Estes reminding you it's only Allah that guides. So we pray for guidance for everybody. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.